tired of the finger pointing, business disruptions, risks, lawsuits, lack of accountability, and the never ending paper chase? For those of you in real estate who struggle to ensure work is done correctly, look no further. We bring a revolutionary smart building solution for any property operation. Stringbean automates your workflows with a library of 300 plus best practices and step by step prompts that place quality control into every task, while our AI escalates any anomalies. To learn how our clients go alive in 48 hours, check out our case studies and schedule a demo at www.stringbean.tech. This podcast is sponsored by Bellissimo Hats. Bellissimo Hats is the number one luxurious hat brand in North America. They make all styles for all occasions, and you can even design your own hat. The price for these quality hats are a bargain, so go to bellissimohats.com and use code SFB10 for 10% off at checkout and enjoy the podcast. Welcome back to the Success from the Best podcast. Today we have Sholem Jacobs. Thank you for being on my show. Thank you for having me. And Sholem Jacobs is the CEO and founder of Jacobs Real Estate Advisory, LLC. Jacobs Real Estate Advisory, LLC is a boutique real estate investment firm, which he started in 2008. Since 2001, Sholem has been investing in multifamily, condo developments, retail office and hotel asset, assets, primarily in the East Coast of the United States, and much more. So thank you for being here again. Thank you. So where did you grow up? Because I know you have an accent. Sure. I grew up in Glasgow, Scotland. Wow. And how was it like growing up there? It was really a great community. Um, I know your mom's from Arizona. Yeah. Right? Um, Not exactly Arizona, especially not the weather. Right. Um, However, the community was really a fantastic, warm uh, community. My parents are the Chabad Shluchim there for 54 years. Wow. So the reason we were there, the Rebbe sent my parents. And it was really, we were just busy um but we were involved in every aspect of the community mm-hmm. and it was really something very special that's awesome so how old were you when you moved to the united states i moved to united states when i was 19. i moved to israel to go to yeshiva when i was 16. Oh, and wow. i was there for three years and then i came to the united states so you're from scotland to israel to america exactly got it so what career path did you think you wanted to go into when you were a kid a uh, great question uh, growing up, my teachers all thought I would go into voice therapy, um, speech therapy. Always loved singing, still right. do. It's my very serious uh, passion and hobby, which I still do very strongly. Um, so I always thought that would be the career that I would go down. Mm-hmm. So how did you decide to go into real estate from voice therapy? Great question. Or speech therapy. Um, speech therapy. Yeah. So after Yeshiva, I was there for three years in Israel. Um, and I thought I would go back to England and possibly go to Manchester University and do a degree in speech therapy. And a bunch of my friends from Israel, uh, actually Medjur Shmo at the time, um, said, you're hanging out with all the American kids. Why don't you come to the US? Yeah. You know, land of opportunity. And I was 19 years old. I said, what do I have to lose? Let me come for a year. Mm-hmm. And um, we had been here many times as a kid. Uh, we, we came to see the Rebbe when I was young. And um, so we were familiar with New York and it was always enjoyable. You know, you, you can, what, what can you not like about New York? Yeah. And I said, let's give it a try. And I ended up coming here and the rest is history. That's awesome. So how do you have confidence coming from a totally different culture, totally different country to then go into the business world when you weren't part of this culture? It really all happened, you know, divine intervention. And really it just, like I said, there was no plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I got here, I got off the plane, um, I had, um, I believe, $1,400 for my bar mitzvah money wow. um, that my parents said I could take out from my savings account, and I thought that was going to last for a while, and I had to, I stayed for a few weeks by a friend's house, my good friend Eli Lutz, um, who was a friend from um, Yeshiva, and he said, don't worry, you'll come and stay in my apartment, he was just newly wed and newly married. He said, you'll stay in my apartment until you find a place and we'll get you a job. And like, I'm like, how am I going to get a job? I don't have a green card. I don't yeah. have a work permit, nothing. Um, and at the same time, I my go. I said, I'm going to go to Turo College, which was the plan, which mm-hmm. I did. I did it for one semester. Um, and I thought I would get my degree in speech, business, whatever I want to do at that point. I always had an edge for business always also. 
Um, but while I'm doing that, I thought I'd work, you know, and make some money. And um, that's how it really all started. What was that first job? It was in real estate? That first job was in Eichler's bookstore on Coney Island Avenue. Wow. So it still didn't get you into the real estate business? <laughs> Absolutely not. Wow. So what was that that triggered? And you're like, you know what? I want to do real estate. So um, after a few little jobs, Eichler's, um, about a year later, I got involved with um, some wonderful Syrian Jews who are like my family today, um, who were in, like, in electronics. Um, it was mail order, camera, electronics, all, this, all these wonderful gadgets are over here. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of those days. Um, and I started working for one of my very good friends, one of my best friends today. Um, and basically, I was a salesman just answering the phones. It was telemarketing. Uh, we would advertise in these uh, old fashioned magazines, camera magazines, it was really high end photography and uh, video. And we would advertise in these magazines and the phones would just ring. And my accent at the time was good also. So that definitely played um, a good, uh, uh, it definitely played a part right. in helping us over here. And basically I was one of the best salesmen. Um, a few months later, um, unfortunately that company closed down three of the partners asked me, do I want to get involved in forming exact same company? Um, just with, you know, some different partners, etc. And would I be a partner? And I said, I would love to be a partner, but where am I getting the money? How much money do I need? And they said, you need $25,000. I said, how am I getting $25,000? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know who to call, what to do. Cut long story short, I put the $25,000 together and, um, all really all miracles. And thankfully I started that company. I was there for about a year and a half. It was right really when the internet was going absolutely crazy. Mm. And that, um, those, um, Xmas, that Xmas season was absolutely insane. It was 2000, I believe it was. The internet just went insane. All of a sudden we we're coming in from having to answer the calls and all of a sudden we we're coming in, opening our computer. In those days we didn't have it all on our phones. And we waited till the next morning till you got into the office, you opened the computer and there was like 50, hundred orders. Wow. We're like, this is crazy. They're just coming in and it wow. all started. And I stayed there for about another year. I tell everyone I loved the money, but I hated the business. Mm -hmm. So I just, I didn't like a lot of the characters and a lot of things that went around the business. Um, so thank God I, you know, I was there. It served a wonderful purpose. And after about a year and a half, I said to three, the other three partners, do you want to buy me out? They made me an offer. And I did it. I executed and they bought me out. And then I said, okay, what do I want to do next? Right. And one of my very good partners, um, one of my best friends I, I was telling you about, uh, Shamo Kerry, he's actually in real estate. Uh, he had been in real estate for many, many years before me. And he gave me some guidance, told me some tips, what to buy, etc. And it really all started from there. So where'd you get the money to buy from right when you got into the business? Do you use OPM, other people's money? We're talking about in the real estate. Yeah. So thankfully I had a chunk of money from my electronics when I sold out the company. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I put in the majority of the money in my first deal. My first deal was 389 East 138th Street in the Bronx. It was an eight family with two stores, a vacant building. I found the deal in the New York Times. Um, that's where we used to find deals before the yeah. internet. <laughs> um, it was $400,000 um, for the vacant shell. And everyone told me buy a vacant shell. That's how you do value add. That's how you're going to make money. I said, okay, we're going to give this a try. Um, I was single, so I didn't really have that much to lose at the time. Right. Um, basically I convinced the seller, um, with some tips from, you know, some professional people to hold paper for me. So he held the mortgage. So I believe he held 200 or $250,000. Wow. I put up the $150,000 to buy the building. Um, and then we needed money for construction. So I took in one of my best friends, um, who's still one of my partners today um who came in as an investor with me and we basically went 50 50 on the deal and um i put in like i said you know all the money that i had and he put in what, what was missing and we rehabbed this eight family with two stores um, we thought it was going to take six months it took about 18 months we thought it was going to cost about two hundred thousand dollars uh for the renovations it probably cost about three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> all right what we we're just talking about before um, I learned about GCs. I learned about construction yeah. and it was anything but easy. Anything that's, I, what this, that's the story of this house. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. What you're telling me anything we thought would happen, didn't happen. And I really thought, you know, within six months, eight, within six to eight months, I'll refinance this property, take out the money. 
I'll have some income coming in from the property and then I'll take that property and I'll buy another property. Right. And uh, thankfully that all happened, but it took obviously a lot longer than right. I envisioned. So isn't it very risky to make all this money from your, you know, the technology company and put it all into one property without knowing, without being an expert in the business? Probably looking back, yes. Right. But back then you were just ambitious and... Ambitious and I really, I knew I had to make it mm. and um, with Hashem's help. Um, I really didn't have a choice. Yeah. And I think when you know, you know, you have to do this. So um, would you say that people, you know, like if they have a passion for something, I'm assuming you had a passion for real estate at that point. Absolutely. So when you have a passion for something, do you think you just go all in on it? Definitely. Definitely. Right. I love the real estate, you know, aspect of things because I really learned it from the electronic business, right? So mm -hmm. we always said that, you know, the sales were crazy today. Like I told you, I sold at a great time, right? A year later, I probably would have got 10 times what I sold the, my shares in electronic business wow. for. 10 times. But you said you didn't do it for the money. I didn't do it for the money. Right. I just I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the money wasn't, you know, it wasn't relevant when you don't like something. Right. Um, but I was just, just to give you an idea of the numbers. Um, but every single day, all my partners would come in and everyone was still paranoid that, you know, the competitor... Um, all the other guys that are advertising these magazines and all these other competitors could just knock you out literally mm -hmm. tomorrow. And I always felt, again, you know, with Yatu Shmaya and everything from Hashem, that um, with all his kindness, I said that with real estate, at least you still have an asset. And of course, there's all risks. I've watched neighborhoods get better. I've watched neighborhoods get worse. It doesn't always go as planned. Right. However, it's still an asset. So I thought at least once you own it, you know, it's now yours. Um, and you know, hopefully you can, you know, you know, keep improving the property, keep putting value add into it. And, um, hopefully you'll hold on to it forever and ever. So, right. and many of those properties 25 years later, we still have them. Thank God. Right. So you say that the advantage of real estate is that you own the property no matter what. That's right. But isn't that only once you pay off the mortgage, right? Correct. So I, I, I'm a big fan, especially after the crash, which, uh, you know, I was very involved with your dad, yeah. Ken Shockman. Big shout out, <laughs> um, big fan. Um, after the crash, we really learned about, you know, um, through not having it easy, we really learned about responsible debt. And I always say debt, you know, especially in real estate, debt is unbelievable if it's used responsibly. Right. Like Robert Kiyosaki, I don't know if you know who he is. Sure. Always talking about good debt, good debt and bad debt. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, like, like I said, you know, if you go out and buy a property, you know, now we're in a little bit of a crazy time, but five years ago, you buy a property, and it's, you know, you put on 65% debt, 50% debt, you're in a great position. And, you right. know, it's good to be able to leverage that asset and, you know, take that money and buy something else with it. A right. lot of times that works, mm -hmm. um, but you have to obviously, you know, it's got to be calculated risk and calculated debt. Right. So on paper, at least, it says that you specialize in acquisitions, bridge lending, profit equity, underwriting, property management, and real estate advisory, right? All true. So first of all, how do you decide to go into those niches, right? And how important is it to find your niche in the business? Great questions. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so the first ones really, again, as I'm going to tell you, was default. So I went in, like I said, and I started buying assets. I mm -hmm. bought this first eight family. I bought another one three doors down. Um, then from there I started doing condos on 113th and 8th Avenue. Um, in those days it was called Harlem. Today it's called Manhattan. And, um, we were really one of the, you know, early, early, uh, builders over there that did all those rehabs and we put in these yuppie restaurants and it was all new. Um, then about 2005, New York was getting really expensive and I found it really hard to get deals and we were competing against everybody. And I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to go out of state, out of state. Today it's a big thing. Everyone's traveling yeah. to Arkansas and uh, Georgia. I was there 20 years ago um, and it wasn't easy, but it was definitely slightly calmer. Uh, right. As we say, out of town, yeah. it was definitely calmer. Yeah. Nicer people, the brokers were less aggressive. The se you know, the sellers would listen to you. You could actually sit and have a drink with them and, right. you know, and um, just talk, talk about the deal and they wanted to get to know you and they wanted to know you know, what was your feelings and why did you really like this property? Why are you buying it? What would you do with it? And, you know, the rat race was a lot less. Right. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And we bought a lot, bunch of office buildings down there. We bought a bunch of retail centers, um, Georgia, Florida. Uh, those were the two main states at the time. 
uh, Alabama. Um, and then 2008 came, I'd have to tell you. Right. Um, we had a lot of debt at the time. Um, thankfully, it was all non-recourse. So, you know, we weren't responsible personally it? for it. So non-recourse means you had someone else guarantee the loan? No. Is that what? No. Okay. So there's recourse debt and there's non-recourse debt. So that anyone getting into real estate for anything long term or for whenever you have the opportunity, you only want to take non-recourse debt. Mm -hmm. Non-recourse debt means if God forbid you cannot pay, make the payments, this property doesn't work, your dream didn't come true of whatever you envisioned to do with it. Let's say you put down, you buy a building for four million dollars, you put down a million and you had debt of three million you, with investors, whatever the situation would be. God forbid, I don't, I don't wish it on anybody. So, yeah. But if God forbid something happened, you give back the keys to the bank and you're off the hook for the three million dollars. You're not responsible. Mm. You lost your million. It's not a great day. Right. But at least you didn't, hopefully you, you didn't have three. That's exactly right. right. And hopefully you have other assets, you know, like what we're just talking about. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. Hopefully you have other assets and you know what? You can't win them all. Right. Right. If it's recourse, God forbid, then like you just said, you owe the four million. So they're taking you owe the house. three million. Excuse me. They can right. theoretically come after your house and come right. after anything they want. So you always you always take non recourse loans. Thank God. Whenever possible. Sometimes for construction loans, you don't have you know, you don't have the choice. Uh, mm -hmm. so for some bridge loans, short term loans, sometimes you don't have the choice. But whenever I can, it's always um, non recourse debt. And even if you know, a lot of times non recourse debt debt is slightly higher rate than recourse debt, I'll pay the it's slightly worth it. higher rate and I'll take right. the non recourse okay. debt. And you said that you went to Alabama, Georgia and few others at that time it was florida alabama florida. and georgia right and how do you have confidence going into a new market that you're not familiar with do you partner up with local brokers bro uh, local developers like how do you know the market so i wasn't doing any development down there it was oh, really okay. buying operating you know office buildings operating um retail centers at mm -hmm. the time um but yes it was definitely getting close and getting to know brokers and they were obviously an, an integral part of what we did right so you'd advise if someone does want to go out of state they should partner up with someone local as opposed to you know just trying to wing it on their own absolutely right because every market is so different absolutely Spe right. especially and if it's construction it's a whole different animal mm -hmm. a development then you really have to make sure you have a partner down there that you trust right with with boots on the ground and uh one. right and you start out in development right and then you got into brokerage is no that no went? so so i started with yeah rehabs you know, rehabilitate, you know, uh, rehabbing buildings. So yes. Right. You know, so how do you get into the brokerage side of it? So brokerage, everything else just really came and we're not heavy on the brokerage. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, just because of things that happened really in 2008, um, we had the opportunity to buy back a lot of our debt. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of the banks just wanted to sell off their debt at, you know, at different prices, 50 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, 20 cents on the dollar. Wow. And we had a lot of opportunities. Um, but it was opportunities in a time that nobody had money. So, you know, people were coming to me and saying, you know, I'm able to buy back my debt for 20 cents on the dollar. I owe the bank, you know, six million. I'm able to buy it for $600,000, but I don't have the $600,000. So that's where we were able to really, we got a lot of opportunity there. We were able to go, I was able to, you know, broker those deals, go to investors, um, put the money in and then get a piece of the deal. Um, or like I said, or broker the deals out to other people and let the guy make some money and I made some money. So that's right. really how all these little other, um, angles came. So that shows how cash is king, especially cash in king. down times. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, uh, so, you know, like the line, you're a master of all trades, you're a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Right. So not you, but I'm saying like you do a lot in the real estate business, not like a specific thing. Right. Correct. Yep. So do you advise people to, you know, should that be their goal? to be very well-rounded or you think you should just target one niche and go all out? I think target one niche and go out, all out. Like I said, because of a lot of different things that fell on my plate throughout mm -hmm. the years. Um, like I said, although we do many of the um, different things you just named, um, our main, our main um, niche in the real estate, I would say is obviously buying mm -hmm. acquisitions. I always say is our first thing. Um, whether that's development, whether that's just value add, but buying <laughs> acquisitions. Um, then we have a fund. Um, we have a lending fund that we do basically, sorry, we, we have a fund that we actually do lending first position and second position money. And we also do pref equity. 
So wow. that's really for other people's deals. That's really for deals that are not our own deals. So someone comes to me and says, you know what, um, the bank, I can't get financing or I'm short of capital and they're doing a raise of $5 million or $10 million, we'll do a lot of the pref equity for them. Mm -hmm. So that's a private fund that we have for the last six years, which thank God has done very well. Um, and what else? Um, like I said, then also we just have some people looking for acquisitions in our office all the time. Right. So a lot of times those deals won't be for me, but they will be for somebody else who has a 1031 exchange mm -hmm. or um, just somebody uh, you know that I know that needs, who would like that type of deal. I'm like, you know what, let's flip it out. So it's, we're able to make a fee a lot of times that way. So why not take it? Right. So, but that wasn't your goal. It just no. happened. It came along the way. Exactly right. Right. Okay. And how big is your firm? Um, workers wise. Uh, yeah. Staff. Um, yeah, so, staff, not portfolio. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we have like 10 people working in our office, thank God, right now. Okay. Um, and then obviously we have, you know, um, managers and general managers mm -hmm. throughout the hotels, the retail centers, um, and throughout the country. So, so would you advise... Would you say uh, a smaller firm is smarter to be successful or a bigger firm? That's why I ask. I'm a big fan of small boutique firms, right. especially when it comes to real estate. You know, I really look at our office today as really a family office that we also have a bunch of investors. That's really mm -hmm. the way I look at it. Right. Like my dad, he says, like, he wants to keep it small so he can, you know, ha be on top of everything, like have his eyes on everything, you know, as opposed to a huge firm, you know, where there's a lot more complications that come. I'm really a micromanager, you know, sometimes, right. you know, uh, sometimes it's to my benefit, sometimes it's not. Um, but and I think your dad's very similar like that. So I think for people like us, keeping it small and boutique is the mm -hmm. way to go. And how long ago did you start? It's JREA, right? Jacob's Real Estate Advisors. Yeah. Right. So how long ago did you start that company? We started that company in 2008. Okay. Yeah. And so how have you continued to grow that? How have you continued to improve the company in order for it to continue to grow? It's all about people. It's all about getting good people on the team. Um, thankfully, um, I was able to bring on my uh, CFO, Jordan Kaplowitz, around 10 years ago. I'm friends with his son. Oh, really? Yeah, Eitan. Eitan. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. <clears throat> Eitan's great. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, you know, from there, we've really been able to grow the company together. Um, and from there, we've just, you know, been able to bring on more good people. But it's really all about having key people that you can trust. Um, if you can trust people, you can grow, right. um, and it gives you so much more access to do more deals. All right. So you would say it's all about the people, you know, don't let anything else get in the way and lose sight of what's really important. The people and the mazo. Right. Okay. And, uh, so a lot of people say that the key to real estate is OPM, right? You always want to use OPM, other people's money. So you don't agree with that? Not a fan. No, why not? Like I said, I've, you know, I've always done syndication since I was young. Right. Um, the last five, six years, I've probably taken less of other people's monies than ever really? and used more of my own money. Thankfully, we've had our own monies that we were able to roll them in from deal after deal, so we didn't right. need it. And also the last three, four years, we're sitting buying really smaller deals while all the other people were buying the bigger deals, which we can get into another time. But right. I didn't really agree with, you know, the numbers the last few years and the cap rates that people were buying and. We'll see how it all shakes out. All right. So, um, so I really didn't need other people's monies. Um, so I think, you know, I think you're always better having less partners. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if it's a big deal and it's big enough deal and you can, and there's room for partners and they're the right partners and the strategic partners and the partners that can either help you or understand your goal and what you're trying to do here and understand most important, the risk reward, which unfortunately too many investors do right. not understand. They're all great, you know, when you're giving them the 8% and the 10% a year, et cetera. But and all of a sudden there's a capital call and, you know, because, you know, you lost a tenant or all of a sudden you have this opportunity to put in a new Walgreens and you need $2 million and that's going to improve the property by $6 million. And some of them that just don't get it. They're not, but right. again, they're not real estate people. They're investors. So you don't want to just take cash because it's cash. No. You want people that are in the business. Or yeah. people that understand real estate. You know, I, right. most of my investors are not in the business. Right. Um, I, would, I, I, I take that back. I would say probably 50% of my uh, partners are other partners that, you know, that are in real estate in some sort of capacity. Probably the other 50% are not, but they understand real estate mm -hmm. and they understand what we do and they understand, you know, the risk reward. Do, do a lot of people just take cash because it's cash? Like they don't even care if the investor has no idea what's going on? Too many people. So you 
like do your research your research you do due diligence into the people absolutely before you let them invest absolutely okay absolutely they t like i say too many people take you know anyone right and it's all great while you're paying them the six percent or right. eight percent the ten percent when that stops then everyone has questions and right and they won't understand even if you have the answers they're not gonna understand or they don't want to understand right so you know what they had no right really investing in the real estate in the first place right Right. So OPM is important. It's just if you don't need that option, it's better to not take that route. Right. I always say, why take more partners if you don't need them? Right. Unless, like I said, you know, you, there's people that you deal with. There's one or two partners that I take into almost every one of my deals. Mm -hmm. There are people at this point that are almost like family, you know, people right. that have really, you know, just done, done the right thing, been there for me through the thick and thin, through the good times, the not such good times, and also helped me realize you know, that th those times when I thought they weren't such good times, the opportunities actually ended up being unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Talking about 2008, really. Right. And uh, that was able to really, you know, put us on the map in a, a big, much bigger way. Right. Okay. Um, and you just closed a deal in Florida, right? Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Right. So uh, congrats on that. Thank you. And so how does it feel to, uh, you know, how, how do you not only just do real estate in this, you know, market? I kind of we touched on this before, but like being able to, you know, go across the country, like how does that, I guess, I don't know if it's like a, co a level of comfort or it's like, you know, where it's like, even if this market isn't, you know, doing so well, you still have other markets to go to. Sure. So like, you know, like you said, every different state and every, you know, different um, county and town, um, city, um, you really have to dig in and see, you know, do I like what's going on? Is it a growing, is it a growing state? Right. Um, you know, what's the demographics? Um, what's really going on over here? Um, this particular deal was actually for one of our 1031 investors mm -hmm. that we're helping out. And they really liked this property. Um, we all liked it, what we're paying per square foot. It was way below replacement value. We all liked where it was situated in Florida. Um, and the other thing we liked about it, the main thing we liked about it was the tenant. It's um, Henry, uh, who's now owned by the Carlisle Group. And they have three and a half years left on the, on the lease. And we really feel, you know, it's a below market rent. So we feel there's definitely upside when it comes to the renewal, God willing. Right. And if God forbid they don't renew, we have options. Mm -hmm. And on that one, you uh, you joined with a local brokerage company, I guess? A broker brought it to us. Okay. Actually, a broker through New in New York actually brought it to oh, us. Oh, yeah. yeah? Yeah. So usually you wouldn't do that, but for this one, I have it to be. Yes. Right, okay. Well, like I said, the broker, the, the actual deal came through a broker in New York. So obviously a lot of our due diligence was done locally through brokers down there. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, fine. So what were your goals when you first got into the business and have you completed those goals? So I would say definitely, yes, thank God. We definitely completed those goals. Um, my real goals were really just, you know, thank God, pay the bills. And I thought real estate would be a great angle, own a couple of buildings and pay the bills and I'll be able to do all the other good stuff that I like to do. Um, you know, helping build Jewish communities right. and my love for singing, which thank God I do in a big way today. Mm -hmm. I try to sing and help out charities and shuls and uh, Chabad houses and um, cure of wherever I can. And that's really my passion. And that was really my goal. But thankfully, obviously, it, you know, it. Um, you completed it. I think definitely completed yeah. it. So once you complete a goal, do you then set more goals, you know, so that you're never satisfied with where you are? Absolutely. So, so what are your goals for the next 10 years? That's a great question. Um, I would say really, you know, continuing doing what we're doing, um, try and really bring in more key people. And like I said, to the business, people that can help us grow and really get ready for, I think, you know, what's going to be a lot of opportunity coming up right now with interest rates being where they are. Um, the market, as I'm sure, you know, from your dad and uh, from the media has really been stagnant. It's really nothing has really been trading mm -hmm. on the commercial real estate the last six to eight months. Very few assets. Um, reason being, in my opinion, is really that uh, sellers are just not realistic that the prices have changed, and buyers are not willing to and buyers are not willing to pay the new price. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I think. So I think there's really going to be a lot of opportunity to come up, and I want to be ready for that. And you know, and right. hopefully, you know, who knows? Um, maybe some of my children will come on in the next few years and. You know, who knows what the future will be, right. God willing. I mean, I noticed that a lot of the successful people in the downtimes, that's when they're either getting ready or already starting, exactly. you know, to take off. Exactly. Which most people, what they do is when the downtime's like, all right, we'll wait till things get better. You know, is that, would you agree with that? Absolutely. 
Like yeah. I said, really the last few years I've been sitting on the sidelines. Right. We've been doing some deals like, a, like you just pointed out, the one for the 1031 exchange, you know, somebody that didn't want to pay taxes, right. would rather just transfer it in. Um, but apart from that, we've really been sitting on the sidelines and doing smaller deals. Really, some of the smaller deals made sense the last few years, but the bigger deals, we just felt the cap rates were not right for us and the numbers didn't go for what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. So we said, let's just sit. Thank God we have enough going on. Right. And I always say during the quiet times also, it gives you a good opportunity to look at the assets you have and say, what else can I do? There's always, you know, something you can improve in a center, mm -hmm. um, bring in another tenant, do some work, bring up the rents. There's always something. Right. So. Okay. And coming from nothing, you must have had a mentor of some sort. So what, what, how was that? What was the impact of that mentor and how did that contribute to your success? So that mentor is my best friend, Shmo Carey. Um, and he was there every step of the way. He is there every step of the way. And, uh, we can talk at two o'clock in the morning. We can talk at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but really we've uh, done so many deals together over the years. Um, and like I said, we're not partners. We both have our own businesses. And, um, but when you have good people that you can really, you know, will give you honest advice and tell you, should I buy it? Is it a good deal? Is it a bad deal? What do you think? And you're able to bounce ideas off people. And even sometimes, you know, we didn't agree. And sometimes I bought something that he didn't think was a good deal or vice versa. But being able to trust people and take their opinion and listen to their opinions, um, you need a mentor or Man. mentors. And uh, really, I have a few mentors in the business, but obviously he's definitely one of the biggest ones. All right. So, you know, many people nowadays, or probably always, they, it's very easy to make excuses as to why you, you're not going to be successful. You obviously want to, but, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you can't, right? You came from nothing. You came from a different country. You knew probably close to nobody here. Nobody. You didn't know the culture. You didn't know real estate. Yet you became successful. So what contributed? What do you think created your success? Because that kind of shows that probably anyone can be successful, right? So what contributed to your success? Again, let's not forget. Um, yes, with God's help, right. uh, definitely you need Hashem by your side. That's, that's first. Mm -hmm. um, Mazel, you need a lot of Mazel. Um, you got to give a lot of sadaka, you know, whatever part of life you're in, you've got to give, um, giving back. I've seen crazy, crazy miracles from sadaka, crazy. Um, then after that, putting in a lot of hard work, long hours, and, uh, really I said, you know, having good mentors and really being able to just concentrate on say, this is my goal. You know, at, uh, it was only about 10 years ago. Um, um, you know, one of my partners, um, we we're talking a lot and he said, you have to get to X amount per month. This should be your income X amount per month between five buildings, 10 buildings, whatever the situation is. And some of those buildings, I own 10%, some of them own 30%, but it didn't matter. And some of them were making $1,500 a month. And you know, another building was making $2,000 a month, but you know what? They all add up. And then all of a sudden I was able to add them up and say, you know what? I'm, I'm at X. Now I want to get to X. Right. And really that's really. You know, I think what you have to do, you have to make a goal and say, where do I want to be in three years or five years? Um, but one thing I really learned with real estate and um, I was told, um, you know, by my mentor Shmo very early on is when I said I want to go into real estate after electronics and electronics, thankfully, you know, it's like an operating business. So I was able to see money very quickly. Right. And he said, be ready, be ready to sit for 10 years until you really are going to understand and really see real money or real equity and a real any sort of wealth in the real estate business. And he was really right. I had to go through a couple a cycle through the 2008 cycle until it really, until I really understood what real estate was. And I really understood really what the value, you know, or I really understood what the values of real estate are and how to look at a deal and um, what's really important in a deal, but it takes time. So it's a very, very patient game. Now, again, are there those people that go out and, you know, in the first year and they're able to flip a deal and, Again, Mazo, yes. Right. Can you make a quick buck and, you know, buy a deal and, and like people did over the last few years and, you know, the cap rates went crazy. They bought a deal for, f I saw people were buying deals on LinkedIn for f $20 million. The first deal, second deal, and they were flipping them for $40 million. Right. I call that day trading. Right. It was a lot of Mazo and, you know, but the deals made no sense. So for the, you know, in my opinion, for the buyers, most of them didn't. So I don't think that's real real estate. I think real estate, you know, it goes up gradual. You know, 3% right. a year, 5% a year. You have to look over 10 years. What did my real estate go up? So That's you, generally what, how to look at real estate, I think. Right. So you would say 
for someone to be successful, they have to create goals and they have to be patient, right? That's Very what patient. I got from that. Very patient. Right. Okay. And um, so, you know, you keep talking about the downtimes in 2008, right? So how do how do you deal with that kind of failure, with that type of adversity? And how would you recommend everyone else, you know, on a general basis, deal with uh, yep. failure? Yep. It was a really a tough time. I'm not going to sit and lie to you. Um, you know, like I said, I'd had a few successful years and, you know, and um, built a company. And then all of a sudden I'm dealing with, you know, all this debt and uh, partners not happy. They're not getting their distributions. And um, some of them really not nice, to be honest. Um, maybe that's where my OPM, my opinion right, on OPM yeah. came from. It really is probably where it came from. And that was fine. Right. Um, but overall, I really, you know, realized that most investors really understood um, the opportunities we had. And although it was really tough negotiating with the banks and um, partners and whatever it was, but, you know, the opportunities we were able to get from those days were tremendous. You know, a lot of the banks were calling us saying, please just buy our debt off us at 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, when else do you have those opportunities? Right. But like you said earlier, if you don't have the cash, those Can't opportunities are meaningless. Right. So you have to be able to have either the cash yourself or investors that trust you, that know that you know that know you're looking out for their best interests. Right. And um, that's really what it's about. All right. So how did did you have in mind to keep that cash in case there's a down, or you just happened to have it from the success from before in 2008? Yeah. Absolutely not. Right, so you just happened. I didn't have it. I didn't. Oh, you it. didn't even have it. I didn't have it. No. So then, how did you bounce back? From, did you buy your? Thank your God, I had a lot of. Uh, uh, yes, we okay. bought some of our loans back. Um, we uh, a lot of times, like I said, there's people. We, a lot of the times, the banks gave us the opportunity to buy our debt back, mm -hmm. um, which was really unbelievable. And I was able to go out and get creative debt. Um, some of it was actual, you know, mortgages. Some of it was new partners. But, um, you know, strategic partners that understood the risk reward. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, you know, overall, most of the assets, not all of them, but most of them, thankfully, worked right. out. So it must have been really tough during that time. So what was your what was your mental space like? Like, what was what were you thinking during that time? And like you're not getting discouraged and just like quitting, giving up. It was really one of the tougher times, uh, the toughest times, um, definitely in my business career. Um, it was not easy at all. I, I had a young family, you know, I bought a house. And I thought, you know, I thought we were okay. Right. Um, and thankfully, like I said, is because of the opportunities, we were okay and it worked itself out about 18 months later. But for those 18 months, it was really, really tough. Um, but what happened was is a lot of people, where a lot of these other services came from, a lot of people got wind, including your dad, of, you know, the success I had in, you know, negotiating a lot of our debt and negotiating a lot of other people's debt. And people were calling me and saying, you know what? I heard you were successful with this bank. Are you able to call them for me? Mm. I heard you were successful with that bank. And um, I was able to help, you know, just be the mediator, you know, yeah. work things out and help other people buy their debt or settle their debt. And then from there, we were able to lend a lot of people money that didn't have the money, similar to me, to buy their debt back. So we were able to, you know, it was another access to making fees. So that helped a lot in, in those times. Um, so we brokered, you know, we were brokering a lot of the cash right. at that point. And, um, yeah, that's what we did. So it was very tough in the moment, but looking back, you did get a lot of positive things out of that. It was one of the toughest times, as I said, in my life. Yeah. And looking back, it was what really gave me my real base in real estate. So, wow. so when someone's in the moment of a tough time of a failure, you just got to think big picture and be like, looking back, you will see, you know, the positivity in this. Absolutely. Right. You got to work hard, um, have good people by your side who trust you. And you trust them mm -hmm. um, and you do your best. All right. So did, would you say that was your biggest failure? I mean, it wasn't much of a failure. It was more the market. But was there? A, do you have a story of a time that you, you know, had a big failure? You really messed up, but you, you know, bounced back from that. So say t 2008, like, you, like I think you said correctly, it was really a world, you know, failure. Yeah. You know, so it was everybody. So that was a little bit of a comfort. Right. Um, everyone was in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some more than that, more than others. Um, however, everyone was in the same boat, you know, nothing made any sense, you know, values went, you know, to the bottom. And right. if you had debt, it was just very hard to do anything. Um, so, sorry, remind me of the second part of your question. No, so I was saying that, do you have a, if you don't mind saying, sure. a specific story of, you know, of a personal failure, but 
you know, you, you stayed persistent and you bounced back from that failure. So definitely I would say that was 2008. There was a bunch okay. of those stories. Um, just one, you know, that was a, a bank of America, um, deal. And, uh, we thought it was a retail center we bought for $18 million. We had about $16 million in debt, non-recourse. Right. So we could have walked away and given the keys back and we had very little money in the deals. The investors had a lot of their money back already from distributions over the last few years. So we could have walked away and said, you know what, we lose a few dollars and be done. Right. And um, Hashem gave us the opportunity to buy back that debt for $2.1 million wow. from $16 million. Wow. Is that so, like an actual business? Do people specifically, you know, like in those bad times, try to buy back the loan for cheaper? Is that like a strategy that people use? So I, I don't think so. I mean, it's definitely not, a, it's definitely not an honest strategy. Right. <laughs> so I wouldn't suggest it, and it's not fun. Right. Um, but like you say, when you have no choice and you can't pay the mortgage right. and you know, the, oh, this was a property that was 98%, you know, um, this was a property that was a 98% occupied that we lost the anchor tenant and all of a sudden it was 45% occupied mm -hmm. within six months. Wow. Everyone was just going bust. And then, you know, all the co-tenants co had, um, the opportunity to leave because the anchor left and that's exactly what they did. Um, and you know, so sometimes you have no choice. And when you have no choice, you've got to do, you know, the best you can for the partners. And um, that's right. what you've got to do. And you always got to be honest with your investors, right? Absolutely. The most important thing I can tell anybody, be completely transparent to all your investors. Keep them in the loop for the good and the not so good. All right. That's probably very hard to, you know, break the news to them, but you got to do what you got to do. Absolutely. But, you know, like, like I tell all my investors all the time, I'm like, you know what, it's, Thank God. You know what? If you have nine wins and one's not so great, it's right. okay. You know what? If God's right. put it's the other way around, then it's a problem, right? Right. right. Maybe, may, maybe you should look for another career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. But. So what advice would you give to a kid like me, 18 years old, doesn't know what they want to do for a living, right? So going to college, right? But after all, you know, all the education, what advice would you give to someone to, you know, help them find the career for them? I would say, you know, speak to smart people. Um, see where your passions are, where they lie, mm -hmm. um, and go with them a little bit. And you can also, you know, you can test the waters. You're young enough. Right. Thank God you can test the waters a little bit. Don't give it too long. Don't go into too many different things. You know, you want to keep consistent, but test the waters and see what really speaks back to you. Mm -hmm. And, um, then, you know, really surround yourself with the best people that you know in that industry and, um, go from there. So like you would say like every summer, like internships at all different industries that you have a passion for. I think it's so important. I right. really do. Okay, cool. Um, and you know, just to close out, where would you say the market, we touched on a little bit, but where do you say the market is now and where do you see it headed in the next few years? I think it's so hard to say because, you know, we live in a, a country that thank, thank God for the good or the bad, you know, we saw it, we, we've seen through COVID loves right. to, loves to print cash. So I don't know what's going to happen, um, but looking through history, you would think now that there's definitely going to be some sort of correction. Right. I can't tell you how big, how small, um, or how long know, it'll take, or how long it will take. Right. Um, too many people I know, you know, have a lot of debt. That unfortunately, I'm getting the calls already that people can't pay it. And what do I think I should do with this asset? Mm -hmm. What should I do with that asset? Um, is it worth saving? Is it not worth saving? And some of them will be worth saving, and some of them may not be worth saving. And thankfully, a lot of them are, no, are non-recourse. And people will be able to give back the, you know, the keys that we spoke about and right. uh, move on. But I think the opportunity will be, the, I think the opportunities will be endless right now. Right. Um, I think if you just hold on and wait, which, you know, we've been doing and a lot of other people I know have been doing. Patience. I patient, patient money. Yeah. Um, I think there'll be tremendous opportunity to buy back a lot of, you know, defaulted debt. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of REOs, you know, just um, real estate that's been taken back by the bank. Right. And, you know. But again, you also have to be very strategic because it's a time when the banks are not really lending. So a lot right. of it's cash. So there's only, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. There's always just, you know, a limit to how much cash you can put out. So right. you have to say this, this deal makes X or I'm better buying this deal. So you always have to make the choice and, you know. Right. And something that everyone has to remember is that in a downtime, like Phil Rosen talked about this, like a lot of people, like they'll get so down in the down times. But you have to remember it's cyclical. You know, it's always totally. going to go back up. It's totally. always, you know, so. And so many people get so down what you just said, and then they miss the boat. It happens right. so fast. You know, um, I will never forget. I was on the phone with my dad um, at the time in the crash one day, and how's everything, and blah, blah. And, you know, you know I was dealing with, you know, 
um, a hard time right. uh, business wise. And I said, you know, it's not great. And he said, Shalom, he said, I'll tell you one thing. And I never forget this line. He said, however fast it went down, I promise you it'll go up much faster. Mm. And at the time I thought, you know what? I don't really know what he means. It was obviously it was my first cycle. All right. I'm like, this is really painful <laughs> every yeah. day going down, watching this, what's going on. But really a few months later, how I saw it turned the opportunities that came to us and like all of a sudden people calling me, do you want to buy this? The bank's selling it for 10 cents on the dollar. This one's selling it for 20 cents on the dollar. I'm like, you know what? I really saw it. You know, yeah. I saw Shem Sand in it and really it did. It. But when it happened, it happened fast. Um, but Always stay optimistic. That's it. Exactly yeah. right. So, you know what? Sometimes you have to feel the pain mm -hmm. um, and you have to accept that feeling. And you know what? It's, it's not easy. You know, God forbid someone loses a tenant. God forbid loses tenants. Right. You know, uh, lose income. It's not easy. Tenants go bust. We had a tenant, you know, there was a, a few tenants were rated companies that went bust. You know, right. they had credit, but they went bust. And they had, a, a, you know, some of them were single use tenants. Well, it was over. You know, so we had to re-strategize and the whole building. Um, so, yeah, you have to really stay optimistic. That's for right. sure. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you so much. I really thank learned you. a lot. I'm sure everyone else will as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. No Take problem. care. Thank you. <laughs>